I thought it was appropriate to have a uh, person from Great Britain to introduce a person from Great Britain. You know, Ken Chumley uh, is a native of England, and he couldn't help that. that was the <coughs> it was not his fault. When he could make a decision about where he really would like to be from, he came to Texas and married a Texas girl. So he no longer has an English accent. <laughs> <coughs> he and his wife, uh, Linda, uh, have three children and seven grandchildren. And they were married in Aylesbury. That's, uh, that's somewhere in, in, in deep East Texas. <coughs> Preaching in a, a you know, number of states, a number of foreign countries. He's preached in England for some, from some time and also Canada. And he's currently uh, preaching at the Belvedere Congregation in, in uh, uh, South Carolina, right across the state line from Georgia, right? So he's uh, certainly has had uh, experience. He's well qualified to, to treat on this subject. Uh, we certainly appreciate Ken for his work. In fact, he's, uh, his work will take him to England uh, Monday. He makes annual uh, trips there to continue to uh, uh, preach and encourage the brethren there. But we want him to speak now on the American origins of Church of Christ by Richard P. Hughes. Ken, come speak to us. Thank you, Ken. I do appreciate the opportunity of being here again. I thank the elders for having me come, and for David, and for John, and even for Sonia for all that she does in the work of the lectureship, and appreciate all the brethren here for all that they do to make this a good and uh, profitable time. Uh, I'd rather thank Ken and Nancy particularly for their hospitality, and boy, they have really had a, had a handful this year. Because usually it's been three of us, then Skip came with his wife and daughter, and Ricky's there, and then when we, Johnny left yesterday, they've taken on Terry and Vicky. So they really need our prayers. But it was good to have a fellow Englishman to lead the prayer. I'm not isolated, I'm not the only Brit that's here this week. But even if he does sound like an Italian mafia man, he is a Brit. And his hometown is about 20 miles from my hometown. But the people from Coventry don't speak like the Burmese. My assignment is to deal with this uh, book, uh, American Origins of Churches of Christ, three essays on restoration history, with Richard Hughes, Nathan O'Hatch, and David Edwin Howell Jr. being the writers and Douglas A. Foster doing an introduction and then a critique and analysis at the end. You know, when David assigned me this topic, I thought, why? Using this book, the very title gets the hackles of an Englishman up, The American Origins of Churches of Christ. But when I read my Bible, I found that the origin of the church of our Lord is not in Nashville or Abilene or Malibu. It's in Jerusalem. And I'm yet to find Jerusalem in the United States of America. And you know, it also gets me a little bit annoyed sometimes because when brethren refer to the Restoration, it's usually they're referring to the American restoration. But that's not the only restoration that was going on in the 1900s. It was going on in the UK, in fact, had been going on in England since 1669. We know of a congregation, I've held in my hand the minute book of the Tottle Bank congregation that was established in 1669 in the Lake District. 
And some of the brethren have seen where that congregation met. But also at the time when Alexander Campbell and Barton Warren Stone and others were working in this country, there were already congregations that were established in the British Isles without knowledge of those that were being established over here until some years later when they read about them, when Campbell's writings began to be introduced into Great Britain. But this book, which is the subject of our review or expose or whatever you want to call it, is published by Abilene University Press. And I left out Christian for a reason. There's nothing Christian about it anymore. The title indicates three essays, as we already noted. Uh, Nathan O'Hatch, at the time of the writing, was provost at Notre Dame University. David Edwin Howell was a breeding and eminent scholar of the humanities at Auburn University. And Richard Hughes, distinguished professor of religion at Pepperdine, but he's no longer at Pepperdine. He's gone for greener pastures, we might say. And you know, I may not get to all of these writings during the time that I have allotted. So I've taken the liberty of deciding that I'm not going to say too terrible much about Richard Hughes. Because the previous lecture that was held before lunch was one that uh, dealt with Richard Hughes by Charles Poe. Jess Whitlock is going to be dealing with uh, some other work of his as well as Doug McClish this evening. So, you know, if I don't get to deal much with Richard Hughes, then it's in the book. But they'll be dealing with it in other ways. Douglas Foster, as he introduces the work, says, Without question, the essays in this volume are landmarks in the histo historiography and self-understanding of the Stone Campbell movement. And Foster, of course, is from Abilene, especially Churches of Christ. Notice the expression Stone Campbell movement. This has been brought up before. That will be found prominently in this work and especially Churches of Christ, in other words, a branch of the Stone Campbell movement that's known as Churches of Christ is the thinking of Foster. These essays are written by three individuals, one of whom, according to Foster himself, is an outsider. Nathan Hatch is not a member of the Lord's Church in any sense of, of the word. And he talks about the fact that they deal with significant developments of the last 40 years to the time of the writing of the volume. Well, significant is dependent on what you mean by the word significant and how they're significant. He concludes his introduction with these words, read, learn, and enjoy. Well, I enjoy history, studying history in general. I enjoy studying the history of Christianity in the broad sense, but I also love studying the history of New Testament Christianity and the efforts to restore such. But as far as this book is concerned, I found it very laborious reading. I cannot say that I enjoyed what I read. But I did learn about the philosophy of these four writers and their beliefs that in reality show the porpoisy of their knowledge when it comes to the Bible and a reckless abandonment of the facts or a manipulation of the facts of history in an effort to promote their philosophy and beliefs to undermine the truth as it is regards to the church of our Lord, the church that he promised to build, Matthew 16, verse 18, and that church which came into existence as recorded in Acts chapter 2, following the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. That the writers consider the church of Christ as simply being a denomination amongst denominations is something that is very clearly seen throughout the book. And, you know, with Nathan Hatch, since he is, makes no claims to be a member of the Lord's church, it's not surprising. But the other three writers, claiming to be members of the Lord's Church, clearly show a desire to denigrate 
the blood-bought body of Christ to promote their theory that the church is simply a denomination. And it's no surprise when we consider the stance of those who operate the schools where these folk were working at the time, those Pepperdine and Abilene, the beliefs that are postulated by these writers are acceptable in those institutions. And the thing that's most important is what was believed by the founders of those schools would not have been tolerated. They would not have tolerated the beliefs that are shown in this book. Let's look briefly at the introduction by Douglas A. Foster. As we've indicated, it's clear that he does not have a concept of the church that Jesus promised to build and that was established on Pentecost. He, in reality, rejects the whole concept of New Testament Christianity. And that is the basic thesis of the other writers. And so what this book, although it purports to be about the churches of Christ, is an effort to undermine the work of the Lord's church. We see the constant references to the Stone Campbell movement. You know, that term has been coined by liberal brethren and those associated with the independent Christian church and disciples of Christ as a means of referencing the Rest restoration of New Testament Christianity in the 19th century. And I know why they don't particularly like the idea of restoration. Because when you talk about restoration, the concept here is restoring something to its pristine purity. Well, they reject the concept of restoring New Testament Christianity. They're not about to restore anything. And so the term restoration movement is pretty much an anathema with them because they're not trying to restore New Testament Christianity. In referring to the essays that are to follow, Foster makes this statement. The authors are all wonderful storytellers who articulate their material clearly and engagingly making the material suitable for audiences in many settings, including church classes and small discussion groups. Truly, the writers are wonderful storytellers who are seeking to weave in their heretical concepts into what they glean from the history of the efforts of restoring New Testament Christianity. And brethren, elders and others that would allow such materials to be used in church classes would clearly be allowing the wolves to come in among the sheep and open the way to such heresy that would take a congregation into apostasy. Unless it's being done in this manner in which these things are being reviewed and rebuked for the error that they teach. Foster says concerning Nathan Hatch, the outsider, Hatch shows the Stone Campbell movements to be a prime example of what in his 1990 89 book he would label the democratization of American Christ Christianity. This indicates that this outsider really doesn't understand the nature of the church of the New Testament or what that those who in the 19th century taught who were proclaiming the restoration of New Testament Christianity. He doesn't know really what they believe. The church of our Lord is not a democracy, never has been one, but it is a monarchy, an absolute monarchy, with Jesus Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords, as distinguished from what we could term a constitutional monarchy, like that in Great Britain. The queen is the queen, but she is, does not have absolute power. And indeed, the royal family of England has not had absolute power since Runnymede and the signing of the Magna Carta. But Jesus is the final authority. He has absolute authority. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. And the Foster implies agreement with Hatch in his writings shows that as an insider, 
He doesn't understand this concept of truth either. Again, Foster continues this popular emphasis on the absolute freedom and ability of individuals to understand the Bible for themselves without benefit of clergy. Oh yes, there was an emphasis to have individuals having the freedom and ability to understand and to study the Bible for themselves without the clergy or the theologians and having their filters placed upon the scriptures. That's not denied. But such does not imply that the Lord's church is a democracy. No one clergy, theologian, or any man has the democratic freedom to set forth their private interpretation of Scripture, 2 Peter 1 and verse 20. Again, Foster writes concerning Harold, a lifelong member of of the Church of Christ. How can one be a lifelong member of the Lord's Church? Can one become a, born as a member of the Church or, or become one soon after birth? Doesn't make sense. But he says concerning Howell, Howell provided in his 1964 essay the first scholarly explanation of the largely southern origins and character of Churches of Christ. And note the title, The Sectional Origins of Churches of Christ. Foster chooses to add the word largely. But whether it is sectional or largely southern origins and character, the truth is such that it does not follow the historical facts to state such. One can ignore facts when one wants to deny the truth of the efforts to restore New Testament Christianity, that we're not confined to the southern areas of the United States and, as we've indicated, to the United States alone. Another statement in reference to how Foster makes, though remaining a theological conservative and a loyal member of that religious heritage, we've heard that terminology before today, how carefully demonstrated that we had developed out of a specific, out of specific historic circumstances. Two things stand out from that sentence. How a theological conservative. That raises a real question when one reads what he wrote. And that he's a loyal member of his religious heritage. He's far from conservative. And then note how Foster refers to the church, as we've indicated, that religious heritage. We see the failure again of Foster to recognize the true nature of the Lord's church. As regards Richard Hughes, Foster writes, like how a lifelong member of the churches of Christ has provided in his essay the seeds for what would some would label the first true truly critical history of churches of Christ. Oh, some may label it that way, but it's not critical. It's critical, yes, but not truly critical. He references Hughes' book, Reviving the Ancient Faith, the Story of Churches of Christ in America. Hughes' essay certainly provides the seeds, but the seeds of what? Good seed or merely weeds that were the essays that Hughes wrote will show. Including his introduction, Foster writes, the contrib contributions of these authors to the movement's growing self-understanding have been immense. Still a movement and not the Lord's Church. He said, this book brings these three essays together to make it more readily available to students and others interested in the development of this significant American religious movement. But reality will sink in as we study this book. It denigrates the Lord's Church, makes it nothing more or less than a denomination amongst denominations. Foster indicates he wants the work to help people make informed, historically conscious choices about our future. 
The real truth is he hopes it will lead many to accept the errors that are propagated and to turn the Lord's church into a denomination amongst denominations. Well, first of all, let's briefly look at the outsider. His essay is entitled, The Christian Movement and the Demand for a Theology of the People. That's interesting terminology, isn't it? A theology of the people. What about a theology of the Bible? The theology that God's Word teaches. He's trying to show that what came out of the Americans' efforts to restore New Testament Christianity was simply the thinking and ideas of men. The basic thesis of this essay is to show that the efforts to restore the New Testament church in the 19th century were brought about because of the changes that came as a result of the Shall I say the American Revolution? Or shall I use other terminology, being a Brit? That's beside the point. But it was the war against colonial rule from Great Britain. And really what he says is they were merely part of a larger movement that sought to bring the ideas forth concerning freedom that came about with that revolution to bring it into the spiritual realm as the people struggled to free themselves from the domination of the clergy system. Now, while there is some truth to the fact that freedom from colonial rule did bring forth a desire for religious freedom, that alone cannot account for the growth of the church during that period in this country. Hatch writes, to explore these questions, this essay will focus on the cultural roots of a movement that assumed the name Christian or Disciples of Christ. Between 1790 and 1815, this loose network of religious radicals demanded in the light of the American and French revolutions a new dispensation set free from the trammels of history, a new kind of institutional church premised on the self-evident principles of republicanism, and a new form of biblical authority calling for the inalienable right of common people to interpret the New Testament for themselves. Questions he references are these. What became of American religion in those years, 1780 to 1920, when traditional values were being turned upside down by what Gordon S. Wood had called a democratization of the mind? What happened when people began to call for a strenu strenuous application of popular sovereignty to the church? What did Christian freedom come to mean for people ready to question any source of authority that did not begin with individual choice. Notice where he places the source of authority. Not with the word of God, but with individual choice. Much of his account, Hatches that is, gives brief notes concerning some leaders of those who sought the restoration of New Testament Christianity. But the quotes that he gives simply seek to tie the efforts to the revolution. Kind of saying, well, if there'd been no revolution, there would have been no New Testament church. But although, as we've indicated, the revolution did give impetus to the desire to seek Bible truth without the imposition of the clergy and theological creeds of men, that was not the only thing that was the driving force behind these efforts. When one reads the full and true history of these times, individuals and what they said, it's clear that there was another side to what was going on. Yes, they desired to have the freedom to study the Bible for themselves without the filters of clergy and creeds. But they were not seeking their own private interpretation. They were seeking divine authority. They were seeking a thus saith the Lord for what they believed and practiced. And thus the rallying cry was a return to the authority of the scriptures. Not seeking individual authority as Hatch implied. They sought to uphold the right to individuals to search the scriptures, John 5, 39. But not that the individual was free to make individual choice as to what to believe and be acceptable to God which is more the philosophy of those who write these essays and some of the other books that we've been examining this week. Hatch 
Send us his discussion on Elias Smith in New England, James O'Kelly in Virginia, Barton Stone in Kentucky, and Alexander Campbell in Pennsylvania. He says they were a motley crew with few common characteristics, but they all moved to similar conclusions within a 15-year span. A Calvinist, a Baptist, a Methodist, and two Presbyterians all found traditional sources of authority, anachronistic and uh, 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 traditional sources of authority, anachronistic, and found themselves groping towards similar definitions of egalitarian religion. In a culture that increasingly balked at vested interests, symbols of hierarchy, and timeless authority, a remarkable number of people would wake up one morning to find it self-evident that the priesthood of all believers meant just that, religion of, by, and for the people. Hatch doesn't know what that term means, priesthood of all the people, of all believers. He seeks to equate it with the context of the American Revolution. But such is not true when it comes to the matter of religion. The priesthood of all believers is not the right to have government of the people, by the people, and for the people. It's government by the Lord for his people. He makes quotes from Elias Smith and O'Kelly that indicate their opposition to what was going on in the revolutionary period as far as the uh, colonial government was concerned and seeks to move those statements pulled out from what they said to make it out as though they were only trying to do what the revolution was doing. Smith stated, many are Republicans as to government and yet are but half Republicans, being in matters of religion still bound or catechism, creed, covenant, or superstitious priest, venture to be as independent in things of religion as those which respect the government in which you live. What was he advocating? There would be a government there would be no government or authority in the church? Or was he speaking out simply against the unscriptural authority of priests and catechism, of catechisms and so forth? He indicates that Smith and his followers called themselves Christians, that they carried on a blistering attack upon Baptist, Congregationalist, Methodist, and Federalist of any religious persuasion. Why? because they were seeking to promote a return to biblical theology and their opposition to denominational divisions and doctrines of men. If they were advocating individual interpretation of scripture, they would not have railed against others who were seeking to uphold the teachings of men. Kelly was clearly opposed to unscriptural church government because he opposed the work of Francis Asprey in setting up an Episcopal system for the Methodists. And he said, I shall oppose your political measures and contend for the Savior's government. I contend for Bible government, Christian equality and Christian, the Christian name. Does that sound like he wants individual authority? Again, he speaks about Barton Stone and the last will and testament of the Springfield Presbytery. But these men were simply wanting to follow nothing but that which was according to the scriptures. And the New Testament teachings. Again, he takes one brief quote from Stone and seeks to show that uh, that was not the aim of Stone, but yet when you look at what Stone did and what Stone believed, how he made changes, not to be popular, but because he found what he was teaching and preaching to be in conflict with the word of God. Same is true with Alexander Campbell, and we won't take time to, to look at all of this because it's the same concept. Yes, there are parallels between efforts to restore New Testament Christianity and the American Revolution, but there were many dissimilarities. 
The conclusion that Hatt seeks to draw from his essay is seen in his title, The Christian Movement and the Demand for a Theology of the People. That was not what they were trying to do. It was a return to the authority of the New Testament scripture. They weren't seeking to establish a democratic or American theology. Now, if one just looks at what Hatch has to say about these four individuals and what they wrote, and just lo looks at what they have to say and does not study the lives and the work of these other individuals, they might be kind of uh, brought to say, well, maybe that's what was going on. But you've got to look at the whole history. Let's move on to look at what David Howell had to say as time is moving on. Howell is not an outsider. Remember, he's the lifetime member of the Church of Christ, lifelong member of the church. But either he clearly doesn't understand Bible teaching or he rejects it. Notice this final statement in his essay. The 20th century churches of Christ are the spirited offspring of the religious rednecks of the post bellum South. Any Yankees in here that might get a little bit offended by that statement? I know there's one Brit that does. I mean, what he's trying to say is, again, the church is a denomination among denominations. Not the blood-bought church of Christ, Acts 20, 28, Matthew 16, 18. And he goes on to give a potted history as well of the church from the early 1800s to the 1960s. And he says, one of the most distinctive characteristics of the churches of Christ from the be their beginning has been the marked sectional distribution of the membership. And then in a footnote, he states, in this study, the name Churches of Christ is used exclusively to denote the anti-instrumental music conservatives. Again, such statements only go to show what Howell thinks of the Lord's Church. He tries to use membership figures to justify his case because after the Civil War, there were more members of the church in the south to the north as the disciples moved away from New Testament Christianity. But if the church was truly sectional, as he tries to maintain, one wouldn't have found the existence of Churches of Christ in the northern states and indeed in other parts of the world. What he's done, as you read what he writes, is to try and minimize the doctrinal changes that were occurring that brought about the division when the disciples of Christ moved off into apostasy that there were more in the north that went into apostasy does not negate the truth of the matter that there were churches of Christ throughout the country. Indeed, he's very dismissive of this quote from uh, Brother West. The Christian churches took their instruments and their missionary society and walked a new course. But then he writes, to state the truism that some people in the movement believed it was unscriptural to use instrumental music in worship services and support missionary societies contributes little to an understanding of the origin of the Churches of Christ. Downplays the doctrinal differences. He then seeks to ask, answer the question he raised, what are the sectional origins of the group? And informs us the most likely place to look for the sectional origins of a church in the 19th century is in the wake of the bitter struggle centering around slavery and culminating in the Civil War. Historians of the disciples have seriously underestimated the impact of these sectional pressures on the movement. And in an effort to bolster his case, he recounts some of the history of the period leading up to the war with the concerns that were offered over slavery tensions running high amongst brethren and points out the role of the missionary society in its advocacy of the union position. But he can fa conveniently fails to point out there was opposition to the society 
on scriptural grounds at the time of its inception. The opposition just didn't arise because of the Civil War and because of the slavery issue. The fact that the society got involved in political resolutions during the war only shows to serve the fact just only served to show that those opposed on scriptural grounds could see how it was being abused and that's why they were opposed to it in the first place. It didn't bring about their opposition. They were opposed to it because the Bible didn't authorize it. And how it uses another interesting argument here. After the war, the South continued to be rural and agriculturally based, whereas the North more urban and where industry continued to expand. He points out there was a marked difference in the value of church property, giving some figures to show differences, and then states the meaning of these figures is obvious. The conservative churches of Christ preachers in the South were identified not only with a sectional audience, but also with an economic class. He then seeks to show by some quotes that it was basically jealousy that caused the opposition to the instrument and the missionary society. But remember, the opposition to the missionary society predated the war. The instrument only came in at about the time of the end of the war. But you know, I have a problem with what he says here about the economic situation, the South being rural and agricultural. And therefore, they were in one direction, whereas the more prosperous North with the industry went off in the more liberal direction. Where was it that lib the liberalism came in? The missionary society and the instrument? Yes, it came in in the North, which was industrialized. But the churches in Great Britain didn't advocate, did not have any problem with those trying to introduce the instrument until some tried to bring it in from the States many years later. In fact, by 1936, very few of the English churches that were part of the old cooperation were using instrumental music. And don't tell me that England was a rural agricultural society at that time period. The 20th century churches of Christ are the spirited offspring of the religious rednecks of the post-bellum South. I'm offended by that statement. And I believe all lovers of truth and the church of our Lord should be offended by it. Looks like I'm being offended again. Someone turns around. I will leave out the section by Richard Hughes, the ap apocalyptic origins of churches of Christ and the triumph of modernism to say he's being discussed elsewhere. Except to say this, he tries to point out that churches of Christ should have aligned themselves with the fundamentalists rather than oppose those who sought to bring in premillennialism. You can see that when you look at the book. In his critique and analysis at the end, Foster writes, that there are some differences between the three essays as well as some similarities. He points to minor areas where he believes the writers did not come to accurate conclusions. But he writes nothing that would rec refute the stance of these three essayists that the Church of Christ is simply a denomination among denominations. He concludes his critique and analysis with these words. With all that said, one can only reiterate the immense importance of these three studies and hope by engaging them, the readers will have a greater sense of the work that still needs to be done on this rich historical tradition. Church is just a rich historical tradition, not the Lord's body. You know, when one begins with the preconceived notion that the church is simply a denomination, it's not surprising that one can dig in and find some quotes and take them out of context from writers of the 19th century and skewer them to kind of back the thesis of their essays. But to do so, they have to ignore the bulk of the works of these individuals, wherein you see their efforts were to restore the church of the New Testament the first century church, 
to denounce sectarianism and denominationalism. But each of the writers of these essays, along with Douglas Foster and his comments in the introduction and critique, all deny one basic Bible principle, the seed principle. The seed principle that is clearly taught in the New Testament. If you want to hear a lesson on that, listen to the lectures from Cambridge a week from Saturday. I'll be speaking on that topic. But in Luke 8, our Lord tells the parable of the sower. Note what he says in verse 11. Now the parable is this. The seed of the kingdom is the word of God. We see here in the parable the principle of sowing and reaping set forth. When a seed is sown... The result, resulting fruit that comes from that seed will be that which that particular seed produces. Now, we've got some packets of seed at home that come from Texas that we haven't planted yet. And those who are native Texans will probably know what those seeds are. Or at least that's what it says they are. So if we plant blue bonnet seeds, what do we expect to grow? Blue bonnets. Not Indian paint bushes, not corn, <coughs> not wheat, not cotton. Now, if the packaging is wrong, we may get something else. But if the packaging is right and it is what it says it is, they'll grow in South Carolina, what we're going to get is blue bonnets. Nothing more than nothing less in the spiritual realm. If one sows the seed of the kingdom, the word of God, the resultant harvest is going to be that which is the kingdom. And those who respond to it will be added by the Lord to his church. But if the, if the seed is polluted <coughs> with denominational doctrine, the result will be that those who respond to that teaching will become members of a particular denomination. If the church is a denomination among denominations, then its members are members of a denomination have not been added to the Lord's church. Final statement. This time is gone. In his introduction, Douglas Foster said, read, learn, and enjoy. I read, I learned, but not the truth concerning our Lord's church, Matthew 16 and 18. But I tell you what, I sure didn't enjoy the experience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. That was a very <coughs> capable treatise uh, on uh, such a disgusting subject, but nevertheless, uh, you can't really treat it properly in such a short time to realize that, but we just weren't going to give you more time. Um, if you want to know the complete uh, uh, treatment of it, you've got to buy the book. I certainly encourage you to do that. With respect to uh, keeping all these individuals at our home, you know, Nancy and I said that uh, and to the extent that we can, we're going to use our home uh, in the Lord's work. So uh, this year, you know, we got uh, uh, two Brits, uh, one guy from the land of fruits and nuts, <coughs> a liberal, and then Terry Hightower. <laughs> we just we just didn't realize the Lord was going to test us so severely. But I uh, certainly do uh, appreciate, uh, speaking of Terry and, and Vicki, you know, they, uh, they, they went to the house yesterday early. You know, they got there before we did. And the, and the windows, you know, the windows are all fogged up. Uh, you know, that was interesting. But there's a very uh, innocent explanation of all that. Uh, Vicki was driving, and she had the windows down when they're driving home, kind of air the 
place out, you know. But she, when she killed, you know, killed the engine, she had to raise the windows up. Well, Terry and Evie stopped talking. <laughs> so it fogged the windows up. In fact, he didn't stop talking when he got in the house. <laughs> and he would talk now <laughs> if he could. <laughs> Uh, we certainly do appreciate all that uh, we've uh, hosted, and, and Terry and uh, certainly Miss Vicki. Uh, we, we would like to hear from her before she leaves. Uh, and we enjoy, of course, always enjoy Ken, having Ken there, and, and uh, Johnny, and Skip, and his lovely wife and, and daughter. Certainly appreciate having them. And Ricky Gambino, it's a, a treat to have him. He's learning all about Obamacare and all the other good qualities of American politics. And we're learning something of uh, British politics, too. And as I say, you know, together we have come up with a plan to uh, correct all the problems of the world. We just don't know how to implement it. If you've got any ideas, let us know. Uh, we... Uh, uh, enough for frivolity. We need to uh, dismiss just for a short time, about 10 minutes. And if you would uh, reconvene at the bottom of the hour and we'll uh, proceed with our uh, next session. Thank you. <laughs>